Hi, uh, my name's Nick Bliss. I'm a assistant principal at Acle Academy. Um, and I'm doing this video because I've been really fortunate that last week we had a two day visit uh, from Sarah Modi uh, from Emotion Coaching UK. Um, and she asked me to put this video together uh, based on some of the stuff that we're doing at school, um, talking about sort of our journey, really, like I said, where we started. Uh, where we currently are and, and where we see ourselves going in terms of our behavior model and, and what it is that we're, we're trying to do. Um, so we'll talk to you a little bit about that. So uh, April Academy, we're a secondary high school um, in rural Norfolk, relatively small on roll, we've only got 500 children. Um, but the school itself has been through a fairly uh, tempestuous journey. It was taken into special measures just over five years ago. Um, and then we as a leadership team uh, arrived not long after that. Um, so we've all been here a relatively short period of time. Um, the school currently sits at RI. Um, and as a result of that, we've, we've had to make a number of significant changes uh, in and around school. Um, and some of those have, have been sort of behavior models and, and behavior systems uh, for things that were and weren't working. Um, when we first sort of came came into into the building, um, so sort of where we were f four years ago when when we all took up our, our posts, the school was operating uh, without much of a behaviour system. If I'm being completely uh, honest, four years ago, um, and when the Ofsted inspection that, that failed the school, um, behaviour was a fairly significant issue here. So um, we came in and. What was needed at that time was something that was going to sort of get the school back on onto the right track again. So we, for the, the last sort of three or four years, it pains me to say, but had a fairly old fashioned behavior model. Um, it was pretty straightforward. It was very black and white. Um, and we operated a system where the uh, children uh, knew exactly where they stood um, but we did operate a system where there were removals from lessons and children were removed to um, an isolation room if the children didn't behave properly in uh, isolation then they could fail isolation days and those days were repeated um, and they could be trapped in that cycle and i'm ashamed to admit that that was the process that we were using um, and it I hate the fact that I say that now, um, if I'm completely honest with you. Um, it served a purpose for us, to be completely honest, um, at the time, and it sorted a couple of bits and pieces out, but both myself and our principal were always uncomfortable with it as a process. Um, truth be told, it wasn't really the reason why either of us came into education. We didn't feel happy treating children in that way and as i'm sure everybody understands what you, you tend to get is a core group of children that regardless of that as a model they still get stuck in that cycle and it appears not to have a huge amount of um impact or effect on those children and what you end up with is repeated behaviors over and over again that tend to just get dealt with the same way over and over again um, and it's, that then just becomes an ongoing battle and an ongoing cycle. And then you end up with a number of children that you're looking at permanently excluding or with high numbers of exclusions for never really addressing what, what the issue is. Um, so the truth is we were looking for a better way. Um, the question was, what was the better way? So we were kicking around a few ideas, um, but we couldn't really come up with anything that we thought was going to be be an absolutely like solid solid thing to work on um then as as fate had it i went on a training course and um i was fortunate again to see uh paul dix speak um and suddenly it was a bit sort of like a light bulb going on to be honest he, he talked a lot about school and behavior systems and the children aren't the biggest influence of influences of behavior systems behavior systems in, in school sort of live and die by the consistency of the adults and it's the, the adults in schools that need to change in order for, for those things to be successful um and i came back to school 
and sort of analysed our own behaviour system and looked at it and, and, and thought that we had quite a few problems uh, with ours and our model. Um, so we started to make some changes. Um, so we adjusted a few things. So we got rid of an, uh, the vast number of school rules that we had to simplify it for the children. So we just went down to three school rules um, so that they understood it. And they were the conversations that staff started to have with children. Um, so the three school rules that we went for was that the kids always needed to be ready to learn and they needed to be respectful of everyone um, in and around the academy and that they always need to keep themselves and others safe. Um, and that was it. And, and the sort of thinking behind that was um, kids carry a lot of baggage with them. Um, and we were aware that we have a number of children that come into school every day. Getting in the building is, is a tremendous achievement for them and that they have a number of things rattling around their minds all of the time. Coupled with that, sort of young people's abilities to sort of retain information, the short-term memory and, and other bits and pieces, and yet we send them into school and try and bombard them with hundreds and hundreds of school rules. Um, and then not only do we bombard them with hundreds and hundreds of school rules, we then send them into five lessons a day, sometimes more, um, and then expect us to bombard them with information that they need to retain as well and, and we are thinking was that the kids are never going to retain all of that stuff there's no way they can and that's why they begin to act out um so we thought we could simplify the system so that they understood that there was just three rules three simple things that they needed to remember that that would make it easier for us it would make it easier for staff the only conversation staff ever needed to have with the students around behavior was only around these three things um so that was like the first step in the process we still retained the isolation um, and the isolation booths um, and the isolation room uh, at that point. Um, again, and I'm not trying to defend it because the truth is there is no defense for it, but we, we didn't have a better system, a better model. Um, but we're looking for something. We, 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 we wanted a, a better idea. Um, Again, at the same time, I was sort of still reading research and, and various bits and bobs that, that were heavily criticizing isolation models and, and so on and so forth, and, and um, was becoming increasingly more uncomfortable with the fact that we were using it. Um, however, you know, the vast majority of schools, I think, still do. So, you know, it was something that, although it was making us uncomfortable, that it was a model that was being used by lots of schools still. So it, it was one of those things that was just sort of generally accepted. Um, and then the trust that we're part of organized uh, for the senior leaders of, the, of all of the schools um, within the trust to go on uh, some training with Sarah Nash um, around sort of like trauma and trauma awareness. And so myself and my principal went on this training and uh, it was one of those sort of uh, like epiphany moments. So we sat there for the morning and, and she was talking to us about, about a variety of things. And throughout the training, um, my principal and I were passing notes to each other, backwards and forwards, um, all the way through the training. And we essentially were just writing notes saying we've got our behavior system so wrong. Um, and so the training finished and I came back to school and I sort of locked myself in my office for three or four hours. And I just scrolled on hundreds and hundreds of, of pieces of paper, drawing things out, trying to work out. and what I could do and, and on the back of that training I, I, I worked out an idea that finally meant we could do away with um, the isolation and I came up with this idea of uh, what we now refer to as our reflection room. Um, now some people might think oh you've just rebranded or renamed your isolation room but it's, it's genuinely not. So we came up with this principle of our reflection room. Now the idea behind it was what we wanted to talk about with the children was that the children take more ownership of their behaviour. Um, and that what happened, it was less about removing the kids from the lessons and the kids sitting in silence in a room um, for six hours on end where no one has a discussion with them about their behaviour, about the impact of their behaviour. And if they didn't sit in silence and do what they were told that they would repeat those days, um, it became more about short, impactful conversations about the behaviour that's led to their removal from a lesson, getting the kids to understand it, take some ownership of it. And then when that conversation has happened, the kids have re returned to lessons. Um, so that was like the ethos of our reflection room. So we came up with this idea and we, what we really wanted to drive it behind is that we needed to get the kids returning to lessons as quickly as we could. So we created this reflection room model. If a kid was 
removed from lessons. They would go to our reflection room. Um, they would fill in like a diagnostic tool that we created um, and uh, with the member of staff. So we've got two members of behavior staff who work in, uh, were working in the reflection room at that time. So they would go into the refre reflection room. They would complete this uh, diagnostic tool with a member of staff, um, have that conversation, and then they would be returned to lessons. And start to finish, that process would take a maximum of 20 minutes. Um, so staff became aware that if a child was removed from lessons, they would be coming back to your lesson again. Or if it happened in a change over time, they would be returning to the next lesson. So there was no more of this idea that kids would be removed from lessons and they wouldn't be seen for the whole day. And, and that culture was broken. Um, so that was a model we went with. But again, it, it, we knew it was going to be the right thing. Um, but the truth was we were sort of flying a little bit blind because we were unsure of exactly how things needed to work. Um, so we were sort of making it up as we, as we went along, to be completely truthful. Um, and then again, sort of more by, by luck than anything else, our, our trust uh, organised for us to have some uh, more trust-wide training. Um, so we uh, were fortunate that we all had uh, emotion coaching training led by Sarah um, and uh, Emotion Coaching UK. And through that, again, it was one of those light bulb moments where it all made sense to us that the way that emotion coaching works and the way that the conversations take place with the children was like the missing piece of the puzzle for how our reflection room needed to work. Um, so that then became the driving force behind everything that we needed to do whole school um, in changing our behavior systems and our behavior policy. So what we've done since um, is reflection room still works the same way. Um, so staff, if a child is removed from lesson, they uh, go to the reflection room now. But we're on about version seven or eight, I think, of our uh, diagnostic tool now. We change it all of the time. All of the conversations now are grounded in the emotion coach's principle, though. So every um, question that the children are asked or every conversation that is had between staff and children in reflection room um, is driven by all of the emotion coaching principles. Um, equally, now that all of the staff body have had the training as well, every conversation that is had between staff and te um, teacher and pupil in the classrooms is driven by the emotion coaching principles as well. The reflection room is evolving and is evolving all of the time. Um, and initially, when we created it, we saw it and viewed it, the, my principal and I, as uh, still was like a behaviour space. Um, this idea that when kids behaved uh, inappropriately, for want of a better phrase, uh, in a lesson, they were removed to the reflection room and the work was done, uh, and then they were returned to lessons. But as time has gone on, um, and we're now sort of 18 months into our reflection room, uh, what we understand now is that it's not actually a behavior space at all. Um, and we don't refer to it as a behavior space anymore. Um, what we refer to it now is uh, like an emotion regulation space. Um, so what we're trying to get staff to understand at the moment is we sort of view it more as like a hospital kind of scenario now. And what happens in our uh, reflection room is the staff in there are treating the children um, to uh, enable them to regulate their emotions again to enable them to go back into the classroom. So generally what has happened, if you think about scenarios where children are removed from lessons, um, it beca it's because of a behavior. And we get very narrow-minded and look at that behavior in isolation. And that's what I think causes us the problem as educators and teachers is that we get too transfixed on the idea of the behavior and that we must sanction the behavior um, and that that somehow will have an impact with the child, whereas the reality it doesn't. So, you know, a kid behaves badly and we sanction the behaviour with a detention for argument's sake. The kid does the detention. The kid doesn't really make any link between the detention and the behaviour because they're children and naturally they won't. Um, but in our minds as adults, we think that's that scenario addressed. Next lesson, week later, we end up with exactly the same scenario again, in exactly the same cycle again situation still doesn't get fixed it's no better um so that doesn't work 
So we needed another way. So what we look at now is this idea is what we're trying to address is the emotions and stuff that have led to the behavior in the lead up to that situation. Um, and that's what we're trying to deal with with, with the staff. So when um, a student is removed from lessons, it's probably because there are some unregulated emotions that have happened. Um, and so they're removed to re the reflection room and our reflection room is now being created as a, a space where there are a variety of things, uh, almost like a toolkit, where the staff in there can um, deploy a number of tactics in order to help the children regulate. So what we have in there at the moment is a, a mobile space. It's got two rooms, one either side. Uh, so at the minute, we've got things like exercise stations in there for when the kids are heightened and they need to burn off some energy. Um, we've got music stations. So when children need to just relax and chill out, they can listen to some music. We've got things like yoga mats if they need to exercise, calm down, lay down, stretch. We've got fidget toys, spinners, poppers. Um, all sorts, bean bags, uh, soft chairs, relaxation chairs, all sorts of things. So that when the children come in in various heightened states, they've got a number of options available to them to settle themselves back down again, to get themselves ready to go back into the lessons. All of that is done as quickly as we can do it, ready to get them back to learning again. Um, and that's sort of the position we're in at the moment. Um, and that's working well. It's working really, really well. Um, the kids are responding very, very well to it. Um, but it is a journey. Um, and we've been met with some resistance from staff, is the truth, because what we are finding um, is that it goes against a lot of the things that we as teachers were told and taught um, when we trained um, and the, the ways that we manage and deliver behavior. Um, in our classrooms and um, in schools generally. So some staff are struggling with the ideas of this is how um, we should be managing things now because teachers, some teachers like the idea that um, behavior leads to consequence and that children need to see that in order for them to be learning to take place. Um, but that's sort of contextually where we sit at the moment. I would say we're still very early on in our journey, although we, the reflection room has been running now for about 18 months. Um, it's evolving all of the time. We're trialing different things all of the time um, and it's always changing. There is big plans ahead still um, for us over the next 18 months, two years for it, um, I would say, uh, in terms of what we're looking at doing. So we've got some quite big plans for September. So for September, uh, we are looking at moving to a school that doesn't award any behaviour detentions at all um, because for probably about a year or so I've been convinced that behaviour detentions are effectively redundant. They, they serve no purpose. Um, the issue is though, what do you replace them with? And not only what do you replace them with, whatever you replace them with has to be seen to be of equivalent value in, in your staff body's eyes in order for that to feel like that it has purpose and, and meaning. Um, so with that in mind, we're moving to a system of uh, restorative justice meetings with staff. Um, so like a layered system um, so that all staff, when there's significant behaviour incidents in the classrooms, we'll have RJ meetings with the students to have that conversation because we are firmly of the opinion that a child having a perceived sort of probably a reasonably difficult conversation with a member of staff about their behaviour and understanding the impact that it had not only on that member of staff, but on that student and on the wider class and school community is gonna be far more purposeful than a kid sitting in a detention a week later, a month later, depending on how backed up they are, um, for something that they don't really understand or make the link for. Um, so that's sort of a model that we're, we're moving to. Um, and again, the early trials of that is, is something that, that, that's working very, very well. We're, we're quite happy with that. Um, on top of that, we're adding in this idea that we really believe that for that system to work and for the staff to buy into it and, and, and feel like that it has substance, we, we need to get the children and staff 
working on this idea of like re relationship repair because a lot of the issues that we found in school um, behavior issues are caused by relationship breakdowns between staff and students um, and perceptions of relationship breakdowns between staff and students so we created a system where not only do staff and students have to have these RJ meetings where we uh, talk about trying to re repair those relationships that we are from September looking at getting the children um, to try and make some sort of gesture towards the staff. So we're in the process of building um, like a gesture menu so the kids can uh, write a thank you card or a sorry card or um, create friendship bracelets or anything else like it's something that they can invest some time in um, for the member of staff so that that member of staff feels like that kid has invested some time to repair the relationship between the two of them it doesn't have to be that it can be investing time in the department uh, helping back boards clean the department whatever it is um, but that member of staff and that student do something together to feel like they've repaired the relationship um, because we think that's going to have far more value than the member of staff just sticking that child in a detention um, and that being the end of it. Um, so that's one of the other things that we're, we're moving towards. All of that really um, being a view to us driving down the number of exclusions and fixed term exclusions that we do as a school. What we would like to do, the sort of utopian idea, and is we're hoping in 18 months time that we would like to move to a, a situation where we become a non-excluding school. Um, that's that's our eventual goal. That's like the end goal for us. Um, but it's going to hopefully be, be um, sort of a natural occurrence of the, the way that reflection is going to run and this RJ model is going to run and the continuing driving of emotion coaching and these emotion coaching qualifications um, sorry, not qualifications, these motion coaching conversations um, that are being had by staff and, and uh, all the way through the school. We were obviously aware as well that in order for that to work, we needed the students to be aware that it was happening. So the kids are, are overtly aware that the staff are doing it, but we've also created emotion coaching student ambassadors. So there is a group of students within our school that have also had training from Sarah so that they are able to emotion coach children themselves. Um, and we have a student well-being area, so they have their own space um, where our student well-being uh, motion coach and ambassadors are going to be running their one-to-one -one mentoring for students from there as well. Um, because we're equally we're aware that students, sometimes the best person for them to speak to are other students. Um, and in order for this emotion coach and idea to, to work and the conversations to become fully embedded and, and everyone to be uh, used to the way that it happens and, and it to become almost second nature for everybody in our school, um, it needs to be not just the adults doing it, but the children need to be natural with it and understanding it also. So that's something else that we've implemented here um, and are excited for that to, to really take hold um, from September for us as, as well. So that's something else that, that we're looking at. Um, so that's sort of where we were, where we we're at and where we're trying to go to. So it's going to be quite a long journey. There's, there's quite a lot of us for us to do still. Um, we're, we're excited by the journey, but we understand like, the challenges that, that, that lay ahead because um, it's a significant mindset change, to be completely honest with you. It's, it's a significant mindset change for most of the staff um, and I think if we all look at ourselves it's probably a significant mindset change for the majority of teaching staff everywhere if everybody was to adopt this as a principle. Um, we think it's quite radical um, but we're convinced that it is the right thing to do. We think it's the, the right approach. We are certain that the old system was ineffective. We are certain that the old system is not the correct way to go. We're certain that it, it, it's not the most conducive way for children to learn. It's not the most conducive way to educate the children um, about all sorts of things, not just what they're going to learn in school, but about how to become better people when they leave school. Um, whereas we, we're convinced this new model is. Um, we're hoping that it's going to be a relatively smooth transition across, but we are prepared for, for everything that's, that's going to happen. So Sarah's going to do some more training for us um, in September. She's going to do some restorative justice training for all of our staff 
early on in uh, our inset days in the back in, in, in uh, the new academic year as we move whole school to this RJ model so that we can do away with the, the behaviour detentions. Um, so that will be sort of an exciting time for us to see how that plays out early on. Um, but we are very excited about what's coming and having Sarah here for the two days was a fantastic experience for us and we're so lucky and felt so privileged to have her here um, because I think as I said to her at the time I was convinced that the idea was right and I was convinced I had all the puzzle pieces I just didn't know how to put the puzzle pieces together um, and then having her come for the two days and look at it and be able to give us an honest critique about what we were doing um, has now given me absolute clarity on the journey and exactly what needs to happen um, in order to bring this idea to fruition and make it happen um, for us. Um, and I, I think when, when it does happen and we get it working, we're going to see the benefits of it sort of absolutely it will be huge for us. It's going to be massive. Um, yeah, so that's it. If uh, anyone is interested and wants to speak to us about it, come and visit, um, discuss it with me, email me. You're obviously more than welcome to. We're happy to show anyone uh, anything that we're trying. Um, yeah, please feel free. Um, you can contact me at the school or um, I'm sure Sarah can provide our details. Um, anyway, I hope that was useful. Um, yeah, take care.